and as I say, it sort of reinforces. So it was 2014, and uh, he awoke in the night to the th banging and shouting at the front door, which lots of them report. Three o'clock in the morning, and as I say, parents watched as he was dragged away to an Israeli army jeep. And he then said, I won't move until I say goodbye to my mother. Uh, for speaking these words, Dia was knocked to the ground, kicked and beaten by Israeli soldiers who two weeks earlier had done the same to his two friends. All three teenagers were accused of stone throwing, an offence that according to a November 2009 Israeli military order could, as I said earlier, carry a sentence of up to 20 years. And DCI, the Defence for Children International, works in a number of countries uh, supporting children and defending them. They have a lot of lawyers, so everything that they have on there will have sources. You can go on the website, it's a completely open website, and look at all of the sources, so it all has sources. And this image here, you know, people think, well, surely it can't be like that. I've been to Palestine, there are soldiers everywhere with guns like that. That is what it's like, that's a daily routine. Children have to walk past this when they go to school. Um, you know, there's a massive military presence, and it is very intimidating. Uh, what happened next, according to affidavits given by Dia and his friends, fits a pattern of Israeli abuse designed to coerce confessions from Palestinian children. Uh, and again, this is around the issue of solitary confinement, so a correctional tactic primarily reserved for adult prisoners, and even then only after they're convicted, but again it's used with children as soon as they're taken into det detention. Uh, so he was put in a window in a cell where he was to spend the next 15 days. <clears throat> I don't know, I couldn't do that, that would drive me absolutely mad, so I don't know how a child who hasn't got their parents with them manages that. So he was interrogated during that time, uh, 15 times for two hours, each all with his feet and hands bound to a low metal chair. So one of the jailers used to beat me, dear, dear told Dick DCI, he would come to the cell with another jailer, tie my hands and feet and kick me hard while I was on the floor, and punch me on my stomach and head without any mercy. In 54 cases documented by DCI between 2012 and 14, the average time an individual child spent in solitary confinement was 11 days, and the longest period uh, in a single case was 29 days. Uh, and then another child held in isolation for 26 days. And again, this just reinforces really that when used intentionally during pre-trial detention as a technique for the purpose of obtaining information or a confession, it amounts to torture or cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. So until they confessed, they were left to fend for themselves, which is often the case. They just put pressure on until they confess. So more than 97% of cases, children held in solitary confinement were not properly informed of their right to silence, were denied access to legal counsel, and did not have a family member present during interrogation. Uh, and in the same time period, more than three quarters of child detainees were subject to physical abuse. Israeli military court judges rarely exclude confessions or other evidence extracted from coercive interrogations. just tells you the amount of children that are arrested and prosecuted in the military court system. <coughs> so they've been facing charges now, stone throwing and uh, We'll have to await what happens to them in the court system. So that's sort of uh, really why I became involved in the work, in our work around our work. We visited the camps, uh, the refugee camps, and uh, met with people from the GUBT, which is the Teach Trade Union in Palestine. It, uh, I spoke about it at a conference actually. I mean, it was, I have to say, it's the most welcoming place I have ever been in my life. So the people are so welcoming. They so want you to be there. Um, and 
they will give you everything. For people who have nothing, so when you're in refugee camps, for people who have they want you, you know, that you always get a drink wherever you go, you always get something to eat wherever you go, which, you know, isn't the be all, but they, they have nothing and they want to share with you. Um, and they're very interested in what uh, happens here, but what they always said, what, what always came across really was that they just want people to understand what is happening there. Um, and there was a lot of conflict at one point, you know, from both sides probably, but I think there's much more, their view is that they want to work on peaceful resistance. So they want to make people aware that what is ha that they are in this situation. You know, we went through a checkpoint, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to go through checkpoints, it's quite intimidating. Um, it felt a bit like being in a prison. And we went through it at a time of day when it's not busy, so in the mornings that you know, the workers have to get there very early, about four o'clock in the morning to queue. Um, sometimes they will get through and sometimes they won't get through. Sometimes they will ju just be turned back and then they don't know why. Uh, they will just be told they can't get through. Uh, but it is intimidating. There's lots of barbed wire. There's lo and as I said, there are lots of soldiers everywhere with guns, which are, I, you know, I'm a very peaceful and passive person. I don't like guns at all. So to that, have that level of military presence, I found very intimidating. Did you get any <coughs> intimidation? We had one period where we went to, we went to, um, there are different areas within Palestine, so there are different, you know, different areas, and we went to a place called Hebron, um, which is, there is a lot of conflict there, it's very tightly controlled. Is this the West Bank or Gaza? Uh, it's in the, well, it's in, the West Bank is not in Gaza. You can't get into Gaza no, okay. now at all. So I haven't been into Gaza. There are people who can get in and out of Gaza, but we wouldn't be able to go in and out of Gaza. Yeah. I mean, the, the situation in Gaza is very um, terrible. There's very limited stuff going into rebuild following the last round of bombing. <clears throat> and I think the view is that by 2022, unless something is done, it will be it, people will not be able to live there water supply will be gone and stuff like that so there's nothing going into Gaza really so it's in the West Bank but um, we were with there is a street there called Tehuda Street which has been closed to the Palestinians so they're not allowed to go down it um, it was their, their busy town centre really and the people that live still in the properties on there the Palestinians have to climb in through the back window so if you go to the back of the street and you will see ladders against the wall because they're not allowed to use their front doors because they're not allowed in that bit of the street so they have to climb in through windows at the back. Um, and so we were allowed to go down because uh, we weren't Palestinians um, but we had a delegation and we had a Muslim woman on our delegation and the soldiers as they left through were clearly very concerned about her, wanted to check her passport again. and. Uh, they became quite aggressive and told us to stop the two soldiers that were at the point checking who was going through. And so we stood and waited and they just stood, they were on phones with lots of guns. And suddenly around the corner a, an armoured truck appeared and soldiers just jumped down uh, with guns pointing at us. And you just sort of go like that. I was just quite shocked because I was just there as a person walking down the street. Why would no, they didn't do anything, they had a brief conversation with us and they then let us walk down the street, but they did stay, there was a presence that sort of stayed behind us in a van, you know, so it's that, you just felt very intimidated by it, I sort of felt very uncomfortable and that it was awkward to walk down the street really, we just wanted to go because it didn't make you feel like you wanted to be there. Um, there is quite a big, you know, it is an area that's renowned that there are a lot of difficulties, but it, it was very intimidating. Uh, it's quite difficult getting in. There's a lot of questions when you go in to, uh, to, through the Israeli airport, and because you fly, in, we flew, fly into Israel. But there's equally there's a lot of questions to come when you come out. It's as difficult getting out. In fact, it's probably more difficult uh, to get out than it is to get in. So you are asked probably more questions on the way out than when you arrive. Which, what sort of questions? Um, where have you been? Who did you talk to? Who did you meet with? Uh, I, I think because we go as a delegation, a big group, we probably get more questions. Um, so they're always interested in that. Uh, I mean, we are 
you know, we want to work with all parties to try and get some sort of peaceful resolution there. We don't want the situation to continue as it is, so we would want, you know, to engage with others. And, uh, you know, we have uh, talked about going, uh, in the past we have met with the Israeli Teachers Union to talk to them, uh, and we did some work with them in the past um, about Holocaust Memorial Day and stuff. So, you know, we try to build links with trade unionists in wherever we can, really, and our aim is always to, to, to want, you know, as I've said, good quality education for children, uh, but also peace for, peace for children, because children growing up, growing up in areas where there's conflict and unrest, uh, you know, it's not good for them. We know that. We know the impact of the conflict on children, it, it will not be positive.